Contamination events are something that has been prevalent all throughout human history. As we have spread across the world quite successfully and developed technology other animals could not even come close to conceptualizing because uh, humanity number one, and also they couldn't even build it because we have thumbs, this has catapulted our species to reach the very heavens and to other rocky surfaces that realistically no animal was really ever supposed to reach. And if you say we didn't go to the moon, you're a huge nerd. Quit trying to nerf humanity. Our species is awesome, baby! Regardless of that, it's not all rainbows and unicorn farts when it comes to the issues that may have arisen due to technology making it possible for us to travel. Nuclear power plants have meltdowns, invasive species introduced into an area they were never supposed to be, or even diseases are all a reality of progress which in turn, we do attempt to manage to protect ecosystems in the surrounding area to varying levels of success, or sometimes it's just a complete failure. If this concept were to extrapolate outwards to the actual universe, then it becomes quite clear that extinction level events for some species are always going to be a possibility. In the events of dust walkers, one such event does happen. As a meteorite touches down on Earth, initially a few small mammals, or maybe even marsupials given that it's Australia, are infected. As this makes the jump to humans, it becomes quite clear that whatever this is, is not only just spreading, but appears to be aware. Picking and choosing their victims to take out, and inspires the infected to, and this becomes a massive threat to Homo sapiens. But it would appear that containment might be a concern to others as well. So today, let's discuss the alien fungal infection, how it alters the neurology of a person, and what in the name of all that is holy is this creepy, just weird thing trying to contain the outbreak. But first, this episode is sponsored by Raycon. Click the link in the description box or go to buyraycon.com forward slash rono to get 20% off your Raycon purchase plus free shipping. The world is a loud place and a lot of screeching is going on at any point in time. This year in particular, actually. With Raycon's everyday earbuds, they are the perfect way to tune out all that noise and tune into something great. Literally anything else besides everyone's opinion on everything right now. Their audio quality rivals that of other big audio brands that you know and love and a price that you'll love even more. There are tens of thousands of five-star reviews out there to back that statement, and with their 8 hours of playtime and 32 hours of battery life, they are up to the task no matter what you choose to do while wearing them. I personally like to listen to them at the gym to tune out other people grunting because I find that annoying, and with features like three customizable sound profiles, earbud tap functions to make scanning through music easier, noise isolation, and awareness mode in case I'm actually like working out with a friend, they are pretty great. So if you're ready to have some amazing earbuds with fantastic audio quality, by clicking the link in the description box below or going to buyraycon.com forward slash Roanoke, you can get 20% off your Raycon purchase today, plus free shipping. All right, let's get back to it. So we open up our story with a view of Earth and what it would look like if it were Australia, like everywhere were Australia. It's Mars, which will never be important again for like the rest of the movie. As we zoom in, something appears behind it. Flying through space and going to this particular point in the universe and this particular galaxy with this specific planet, Aurora Borealis, and in this part of the country at this time of year, how peculiar. A meteorite flies through the air making impact with the ground because it has the right stuff. The radio tower then goes out, presumably due to some sort of electromagnetic pulse released by the collision, although it may have really just been more intentional, stranding the town in a total communication blackout, apart from short-range radios. A man gets out of his truck, clearly being sent to fix it. First, uh, this is the most unbelievable thing, is a company actually fixing their towers this quickly. He must be the alien. There is a quadruped out there, as he leans down and touches a rodent, who has stalks growing out of it. Like, okay, that's pretty dumb. I break away to always tell you the same thing. It is man's God-given right to poke things with a stick so we don't have to use our hands. Why this man would touch a bodied rodent that looks like that with his fingers? I mean, this kind of means he deserves this. I don't make the rules. I am just always concerned with the concept of standard precaution. Everything and everyone is always infected with everything. Which is great for health anxiety, by the way. If the diseases don't get you, the cortisol will. So as he struggles for control with something in his neck, eventually it makes its way through his face as he's overtaken by the growth. Panning over the barren wasteland of Australia, this just looks like northern Texas actually. We meet a group of teenagers who are just randomly sleeping on a porch for some reason. The question is why? I mean, I've slept on decks as well because we've run out of space, so I guess I cannot talk too much smack. Or can I? Have you seen this channel? Uh, this is weird. And also, I may have been weird for doing that. But mine was out of necessity though. Not just hanging out with the squad on a deck. So as the girl looks out, she spots something up in the sky and is like, Oh, that's weird. Anyways, like gal, those are aliens. As the youngling then wakes up, we can hear something making a thudding noise as he heads over to his mom to wake her up and tell her. She plays a dangerous game of, I'll wake up in a few minutes and then goes back to sleep. We've all been there. Definitely missed out on an interview one time because of that. But the reality is, you could hit him with the power move of being offspring like I used to do, which is I would 
always enter a room silently and then just stand there close to the face of my dad until he woke up. How I was not swung on my father is beyond me. Because, like, I don't know. Obviously, I think it's a genetic thing. I'm sure others have done this as well. I definitely took 10 years off his life. And then I'm pretty sure when I have offspring, they're going to do it to me. The circle of life. So anyways, he goes to his aunt's room and then wakes her up to tell her the same thing. She hears a thudding noise as well and then actually gets to check, but really sees nothing. And that is some major foreshadowing in this movie. Hearing a lot of stuff, but not seeing anything. Strap in, it gets worse. Meanwhile, a random dude is also waking up. Everyone looks pretty hungover. He gets a call about the tower being out as Joe calls him to discuss it. I mean, I guess the tower wasn't completely or wasn't out completely because they're still like getting phone calls in the first place. But that is also something with this movie. Like half the time, the rules don't even apply to what like they're saying is going to happen and then for some reason they apply later so as he goes to use the landline the power starts flickering joe then talks to her sister about moving and she remarks it doesn't have our dirt okay then well i imagine even under the city there's still the same type of dirt so you should be good to go of course i don't want to move into any major cities either so i mean i get it back at the tower joe then pulls up to talk to the guy sent out there to fix it after the other victim never reported in somehow his truck just vanished which is rather interesting the new guy can't figure out why it broke there was no storm there was no earthquake and he says it looks like it was done deliberately he can't fix it despite being the guy sent out there to fix it yeah, you're pretty useful there bro we need an adult an adult here adult so as joe walks around she finds a blood trail leading into a hidey hole seeing this uh this does something to australians minds uh, so he's like oh there's a blood hole over there so he then starts kind of flirting with her as she leaves and then drives back to town and over at the cafe at the town everyone's kind of getting breakfast and whatnot it's the only place to eat joe asks if she's heard anything and she's like it's like oh the cafe owner's like we heard a thudding noise but it doesn't look like a storm yeah there was no storm you would think they would all know that but as mr viking in the back continues cooking he hears a dog yelp heading outside we hear ripping and splattering noises at least according to the subtitles and a shriek as anthony is now sporting the same cool neck wound as everyone else walking off in sort of a daze that's the cook so they kind of follow him and ask where he's going but then they find blood on the ground and finding a dog pile near the fence that ain't looking too good so joe tells the owner of the cafe that nobody is to touch that thing as we jump over to the teenagers living in the most boring existence known to man hashtag just central australia things they then call out to joe about anthony as she tells them to tell her if they see anything suspicious over at the park the younglings continue to play as apparently there's only like four offspring in this entire town yeah i think the town is going to end up drying up before too much longer because it's not being replenished so as the two walk off to use a bathroom or like two of them do they are being watched and that's never a good sign. Another man is infected and begins his walk back to town as well. And we have no clue how he got infected, but it highlights a massive problem that we will see later. Also, back at the uh, teenagers, this gal is using a telescope during the day. Yeah, blue sky must look amazing, I'll tell you what. Just don't scan by the sun. Goodbye retinas, we hardly knew you. As Emo Aussie then looks out, they continue to observe Anthony's strange behavior and then see another man staring up at them. As you are about to find out, the stakes are not very high in this movie. Like at all but at least they are amassing and doing something i suppose out in the field we now meet miss american geologist finding white goo all over the rock she then takes some pictures and drives back to town over at the police station nobody apparently wears any uniforms and denim is alive and well jeans jeans jackets and jeans shirts the only thing Joe is lacking is pretty much mustache. Luke is unplugging the Ethernet cord trying to fix the server, and that'll probably work. And, you know, you might as well just give it the old college try, my man. I mean, screw it. But during that fruitless endeavor, Joe calls Bill over at the tower. Well, Bill is already straight up tripping looking at the trees as he's already at the park covered in human blood. The younglings that didn't go to the bathroom are looking at him as he's just standing there menacingly. Sam goes outside and calls to him, but he continues to remain motionless. Seeing the blood, she asks him, what happened, Bill? And uh, his face also appears bruised in rough shape. Not sure I'd talk to that guy. So she does the only thing that she can think of at a time like this and closes the door and the blinds. Hell yeah, sister. If he can't see you, you're not in there, right? So as she assumes he's going to be doing something, this actually is the right move, but the music swells and it's looking like he could attack at any moment, but he does nothing. See, like, the stakes are so low. Blue balled again. Back at the gas station, the geologist shows up telling them that they need to see this. They pull up to a hole in the ground as Joe says, Oh, it's a meteorite. Oh, that's British. It's not Australian. As the geologist remarks how it's solid rock. 
And a meteorite could not have done this. Like, what? Uh, yeah, it most certainly could have done this. Like, gal, what? Does she have a degree? Did she fail out of classes? What do you think? Like, are rocks hard? Yes, they are, but a meteorite could have definitely punched a hole in the ground. So Joe then asks her theory about it as she points to the sky saying, it was aliens. It, it, it could have just been a meteorite. Like, I really... Uh, anyways, like any standard geologist I've run across, she's absolutely insane. Right next to marine biologists, actually. Like, this is the real thing. Maybe you... Maybe you just have to be quirky and to go into that field, but every geologist I've ever known, I mean, maybe there's something like, it takes something special to get excited about rocks. I'm not sure. What is going on with you guys? Are you guys, is everything all right at home? So they leave the site then ignoring that, but back in town, Sam keeps looking at Bill, who's not moving. Behind him is a bloody scar from one of the younglings that's just kind of laying on the ground. So as they look out, he's gone for some reason, and the infected are like Batman levels of disappearing, or they're good at that, it's really kind of strange. But grabbing the offspring, she then leaves them outside. Probably should have done some reconnaissance first, you know, check the area to see if he's just literally around the corner, just outside the door or something. Or just go outside immediately with two people whose top speed is like 10 miles per hour, I don't know. So she brings them to another building at this point, which we learn is a little odd. Over at the tower, they then check to see what's going on, finding Bill is now gone, along with more blood on the rocks. Blood just appears to be everywhere, which is a bit strange considering, as we will see, when this thing infects, it doesn't really actively leave open wounds or anything. It simply just slips past the epithelial barrier of the body, which is skin, and then moves deeper into the body. The geologist then points at a rat with stalks growing out of its back, but doesn't do the dumb thing and touch it. Restraint from a geologist? No way. Over at the library, Bill is once again finding the building that they are in, and the offspring then hands Sam Excalibur, that is randomly at the school, like for real, why is that here? Exiting out of the room, she then locks them in the building, right? Not a fire hazard at all. And this just brings up further questions. Why does this lock from the outside? What is its purpose? Sam then takes off running and then heads towards the principal's office, and I assume like the phones are down, so she uses the radio to call Joe. Over at the police station, one guy is complaining about what he found as he has an animal in a Ziploc bag. And thanks for putting that on the counter, bro. Hearing Sam on the radio, Joe then goes to talk to her sister. Luke tells Harry to take that thing off the desk and go away. Sam informs Joe about Bill, lots of names here, as then she heads over to the school. Walking outside, they mention how nobody is out, and that's a little strange. And it's not, is it really that strange? It's Australia at midday. Don't you like spontaneously combust if you go outside? And there's like four people in town anyways. Looking towards the other side of the street, they then spot Anthony just continue to sort of vibe it out. What an absolute chad. Arriving at the school, Joe then approaches Bill, who's standing there menacingly as always, and he says, I want the other one. He already took out the female offspring, and now he wants the male offspring. Assumedly, these are his offspring in particular. Joe then tells him to wait there for a minute, despite him being covered in blood, as Sam comes running over. You see how low the stakes are? Like, nothing is happening. I mean, sure, it appears if someone gets a hold of their offspring, they will end them, but they won't do anything, like, actually past that point. Joe then enters the bathroom, finding blood, and opening the stalls, she sees the female offspring totally ripped apart and all over the area. Hmm. Bummer, bro. That's like Dumple Stiltson levels of destruction for that stall. Heading back outside, she pulls the old forced multiplier on him, which she never really needs to use in any amazing capacity. Like, it's just kind of lame. She then orders him to turn around and stop, and somehow he actually complies. Like, you can arrest these things. How are they a threat? So let's talk about this for a moment, because so far, I have just been dumbfounded by what's happening that I forgot to mention, like, human capacity for thought. So as we can see, obviously, human thinking patterns can be overridden, which would imply that the human brain would be affected in a fairly large capacity. However, it appears there needs to be very specific circumstances in which this process can take place. In the absence of stimulus, an action isn't necessary, and the intricacies of a human relationship appears to be the stimulus necessary to inspire action. What does that even mean? We're going to talk about that. Upon infection, it's clear whatever this fungus is, is alien in origin, and as such, we would not be sure how it affected us neurologically. What we can see, however, is once entering the body, it is naturally drawn towards the brainstem and the main portion of the central nervous system, which is the most important organ, according to that organ, the brain. The question is, why? It would appear to me that this particular fungus is drawn to electrical activity. This may be the selection process it uses in order to know what is worth infecting and what isn't. Because of this, we can extrapolate it outwards and assume that where it comes from, the animals there must have had some sort of electrical communication housed within their own bodies, and this allows them to be controlled by the infection. So it might be the selection process of, do I either pilot this meat suit or do I just break down this meat suit? If something is gone and there's no electrical activity, it'll be used for nutrition. If there is electrical activity, it'll be used to be controlled so that it can go get more things with electrical activity. 
Of course, that's the issue with the concept of invasive species though. Like take a lionfish for instance. In its native waters, it's not top dog. In fact, it's regularly eaten by other fish as they are resistant to the toxins that it produces. But someone eventually released a lionfish into local waters of the Caribbean, and as a result of having no natural predators that can deal with these toxins, their numbers have exploded. Expeditions are usually regularly planned where tourists are given harpoons and basically told that if you see a lionfish, take it out. It's pretty wild. But I bring up that comparison because while the fungus is capable capable of infecting humans and really any other animal quite easily, this is likely due to the fact that native species that it exists to infect likely have some ability to actually overcome the infection process through potentially immunological functioning. Like, for instance, if you're infected by... I don't know, jock itch or athlete's foot, right? It's probably not going to take over your body. It's more of an annoyance than anything because your body can pretty much deal with it. But something similar on Earth to compare it to is kind of like how Europeans had to deal with smallpox regularly, which, while not an amazing survival rate, it still was like, it didn't eradicate Europeans. But when this disease came to the New World, the death toll would be much more devastating as they had no resistance to European diseases. But anyhow, back to the fungus. Upon reaching the brain, it does not appear as though any brain damage is really taking place. And this would indicate that the fungal mass itself is releasing a compatible neurochemical in the brain, causing the neurons to fire in a pattern which it sees fit. Of course, the question from here is, what is the proof that that is happening? Well, when we get deeper into the discussion of the neurology behind it, we will talk about it. So Sam enters the bathroom calling out where she finds the male offspring hiding in the stall. Bringing him out, Bill is in the truck already, just sort of, I guess, hanging out. Sam then tells Joe what happens as Joe tells her to get the younglings in the car and go to the station. So while all that crap is going on, Luke then approaches the porch people and where they're just kind of hanging out. He then heads towards Anthony as he has the fungus move under his face. Anthony disappears Batman style almost immediately and somehow nobody knows where he went. <laughs> yeah, okay, alright then. Heading inside of the building, they say they can't get out as someone jam the door and they're like freaking out about it right so ask yourself who jammed the door have any of the infected actually shown that they have any forethought it's a resounding no things are just kind of happening because they're just happening either that or someone pranked him john i have no idea so luke pulls out man's answer to the xeno scum and then starts looking around he gets the door open as it was literally just a small bed frame in the way like i feel like five people on a deck could have easily opened this also i just want to point out Again, they were freaking out about being left behind, right? They could have literally just used the rooftops next to them as the deck leads directly to the roof. Like, just jump over the banister. So, with any forethought, they could have just walked their way out or just climbed down. Like, nobody's doing anything. This whole invasion is hinged upon people not making any actual normal human decisions or understanding they can definitely jump down a two-story deck and live to tell the tale if you just bend your knees on impact. It really isn't that difficult. So releasing these nerds, they then run by, leaving Luke behind, who continues looking around. Of course, he kind of sucks at it, though, as Anthony gets into the building. Somehow, missing him walk by, at, he was just right in front of them. Like, my boy, how did you not hear him? Or see him running down the hallway? Nobody is this stealthy. So what is even happening? Bang up police work, that's what's happening. Walking downstairs, a woman then calls over to Luke, telling him, Anthony grabbed me really hard, and she freaked out. Marsha tells Luke not to hurt Anthony, as then Anthony just kind of like knocks the force multiplier out of his hand. Luke then punches him, but it does nothing as Anthony grabs her to pull her away, which then Luke fires around into his leg, sending Anthony lumbering off. So, as we have just seen, facial changes are beginning to take place, but why? That's easily enough explained. From what I gather, the fungus is actually just below the skin. The bulk of it appears to rest near the brow ridge of the skull, and potentially for good reason. This organism is something of like a hive mind, potentially just on a larger scale, but individually, you can kind of think of the entire form like a mass of alien neurons. The whole body of this creature moves and communicates amongst itself, which isn't too strange of a concept, as after all, cellular differentiation shows that stem cells can become muscle, or neurons or skin it really just depends on which genes are turned on and off with this creature you can kind of think of each individual cell like a muscle cell a nerve cell and an epithelial cell all at the same time as all the cells do not appear to really differentiate to develop any specialized function except for the stalks and spores which we'll see later on while in its infective form however communication runs from cell to cell all sitting on the brow ridge of the person it is very likely it is also spreading into the ocular cavity 
And with that, following the optic nerve on the back of the eye as well. And this is why some of it is also on the back of the neck, interacting with the brainstem in order to control the body at first to stop any action from the host that might impede its progress. As time passes, however, it then spreads to the front, gaining access to different areas of the brain, causing it to unlock different abilities. At first, the infection would essentially leave the person conscious, but unable to act as it controls their body. As the body then moves around, this may be why they end up standing there doing absolutely nothing in the face of anything that is happening. Essentially, their cerebellum and brainstem are pieces of their brain that are going to be largely controlled. As the fungus moves around, gaining access to the optic nerve, a new area of the brain would be located. We can assume to a degree that the temporal lobe also becomes affected by the fungus through the ears, which we will see in a moment. But after accessing the optic nerve, this will put it right underneath the frontal lobe of a person where that good stuff is. Memory, emotional control, and logical thought. All of it would ultimately start to be controlled, allowing for the fungus to not only control the body more fluidly as there's no resistance, but disrupt the host's ability to fight back entirely by muddling the thoughts as one will be described here in a moment. This is really as easy as causing neurons to randomly fire, not to seizure levels, but enough to disrupt normal communication patterns of the brain, causing what would essentially be a neurological noise. Obviously, this would have an effect on consciousness as well, which in turn would likely cause the person to be able to occasionally see what they were doing before the noise returns and then overtakes their thinking once more. The only thing that seems to really work is shock. After being hit in the leg, this would be so painful it would send an electrical shock all over the body to report to the brain, yo bro, I'm straight up not having a good time over here, as then this appears to hurt the fungus in the process, indicating there is a certain level of connection, and this causes Anthony to lumber off as we have just seen. Also, his face does the I am legend thing, where his like mouth opens really wide. That That's just kind of stupid. I mean, obviously the muscular contractions of the jaw would open up the jaw further than normal, but there's really no point to it. Anyways, meanwhile over at the cafe, one woman watches the stalks come out of a bug. As she gets blasted in the face with spores, phrasing, uh, <laughs> It's not really looking good. And as you're about to see here in a while, while the whole problem isn't as easily solved as one would think, it's it's kind of a big issue. So with spores now coming into the picture, the infection vector appears to have changed from like just an invasive species based on touch to one that can be breathed in. Entering the nasal cavities within the area of the nose, there is actually a, a small area where nerves come out and these nerves follow up to the base of the brain. It's clear the spores will enter this area, travel up to the brain where they will have a similar ability to interface with the frontal lobe, much like the mature version of the fungus. A similar process is actually observed in the brain-eating amoeba, Negleria fowlerly, which, uh, apart from prions, scares the absolute hell out of me. Like, anytime I get into a lake, it's probably anxiety. <laughs> And so, like, it's kind of a curse to know the things. Like, when you when you go into microbiology, that's the biggest issue. You know, like, about stuff, and it's horrible. Um, I always think I'm infected with a brain-eating amoeba after every time I've gotten into a lake. It's really stupid. So, the dad of the year then keeps walking down the street as everyone is just sort of gathering up and standing out in the open. Ooh, scary. Like, so far, if you aren't infected, there's really not that much of a danger to you if you aren't related to them. So, Dad of the Year then sniffs the air and takes off in a dead sprint as Luke goes after him. However, Luke apparently hasn't done anything concerning physical conditioning, so after like 40 yards, he gives up the chase. You really gave it your all there, bro. So here we see, this kind of supports the idea that the fungus is actually entering the brain and the frontal lobe. Contained within the skull is the olfactory bulb, and this is used to determine sense and actually is closely linked to memory. Sometimes you'll be sitting there and then catch a whiff of something and be instantly transported back to 1998 walking through a grocery store. It's pretty wild. Also, I am that old. Regardless of what you know, I'm talking about. The point is, uh, the sense of scent, while not incredibly strong in humans, is still strongly connected to the activation of memory, which if we take a look at what the fungus is doing, it begins to show there is a goal in play here. As the olfactory bulb picks up a familiar scent, this would obviously activate memory regardless of what the person wants. Having this memory activated, it's clearly in relation to his family, and it is a powerful stimulus. Because of the strength of this memory and the neuron activation downstream, the fungus directs the body to take off. Interestingly though, it seems to show the fungus has more and more control over the body as time goes on. Movement becomes like, or at least goes from a shambling mess to being able to take off in a full sprint, which involves a lot of fine muscle control. Speed and strength appear to increase, indicating that the typical barrier in the brain that stops you from using your body at its full capacity is also overridden as a signal is no longer being sent out. Which basically, what am I even saying there? If you weren't aware, as always with there's new people on this channel, your body without training really only uses about 30 to 50% of your strength. Even with training, it is hypothesized power lifters, for instance, still are not lifting at maximum capacity. Well, it's not really hypothesized. We know they're not because they're not tearing muscle every single time, but they can tear muscle. They're using roughly about 70% of their strength. 
And this is by design. If our bodies were to go full out like every single time, every day, this would tear down muscle so quickly. And this would put our ability to heal under maximum pressure all the time, which is not actually that great for you. Muscles would break down, tendons and ligaments would tear, bones would break. It would not be a great thing. This built-in barrier prevents this from happening, but under very specific life and death scenarios, this can be overridden. My favorite story is about a regular man who had a boulder fall on him as he was sliding towards a cliff's edge. He had like grabbed the 800 pound rock in a bench press position essentially before he was going over the edge like the rock was riding him down. He was able to lift it off of himself, completely ripping his pectoral muscle away from his rib cage, but he survived as the rock continued on its way. It kind of highlights the strength that is in our meat suits, that isn't readily available for us to use unless we are about to take a dirt nap over it. In the same vein of this, this is how I believe the man's sprinting and subsequent attacks work. His brain is no longer in the driver's seat and the fungus is simply using what is available in order to run. While this would most definitely break down his body over time, I do believe we see that in some capacity in the faces of those are, like who are infected, we're beginning to kind of observe the effects. Bruising is quite prevalent, indicating broken blood vessels and damage to the body. Under the layer of clothing on their body, it's also highly likely that damaged blood vessels and muscle tears are quite prevalent, indicating there are issues within the body that would very much so likely continue to build up until the body is overwhelmed and likely turned into nothing more than a biomass for the fungus. So Joe goes after dad of the year, losing him in the back of the house as his wife is cleaning dishes. He appears in the doorway and then walks up to her basically just taking her out. So at this point we can see probably you have to have some sort of relationship with the infected for them to go after you, which I hypothesize again requires the memory of the person or to inspire this big of a response. But the question is why? Isn't it always? Of course it is. This channel hinges on answering questions nobody asked. Essentially, as we will see, the fungus operates much like the cordyceps appears to in ants. Again, much like cordyceps, this will spread through an ant colony, taking out the entire thing, if not properly managed by other ants, who will essentially push the infected ants away. And this fungus appears to do something similar and stick with familial lines to infect. Now, this might be because whatever planet it hails from, potentially the minds of animals it would infect, allow it to return home and infect its own family or group because those would be in the forefront of a newly infected animal's mind. In humans, it may be that the fungus has to use the interpretation of the brain and how important someone is to someone else. While there are other animals around, the same level of neural activation is not inspired by someone else in town, quite like family is. And so the fungus has a tendency to go after offspring or spouses, as opposed to just random cops who can arrest them. This shows a desire or predilection of the fungus itself, indicating there is a level of sapience that the fungus has, making this a sort of hive mind scenario. So Joe arrives way too late to do anything about anything. And remember, uh, based on that, you are your first line of defense. Cops are just there to typically zip up a body bag, stay strapped or get clapped. Dad of the year then stands out in the field as Joe sweeps the house, looking around, finding the wife has been taken out. Heading outside, the man is gone. Meeting back up with Luke, dad of the year does show up with his offspring. And here, we see something that will be expanded upon later. While the desire to take out one's own offspring is there, there is some level of base consciousness that can break through occasionally. The man approached the officer very clearly because he did not want to take out his own offspring. Like he had no need to basically approach them. But once getting there, control was lost again. And this seems to show that the grasp the fungus has on the mind is not complete and it is still a constant fight within. To me, this does indicate the brain is not damaged, just disrupted. Enough neurons are being fired to cause chaos concerning consciousness and forethought. But every once in a while, either due to the fungus making a mistake or since it's a literal struggle for the fungus, it becomes exhausted or its basically supply of neurochemicals is exhausted. And this may be for the simple fact that the human brain is not like a regular animal's brain because we do think a lot. We're just not entirely driven by instinct depending on who you ask. As a result, if you were to say like to go after something like Dr. Mambo's brain, which is my cat, Cat, because he is in fact an orange cat, it would be totally having free reign with very little resistance, but then again, he doesn't really have a brain. But with humans, it's a constant struggle to prevent consciousness from breaking through, ultimately exhausting the fungal resources from time to time, more so during a period of high emotional input, seeing as this dude just took out his wife. Since losing control after arriving, he then grabs Joe, lifting her up as Luke uh, kind of just gut shots him as he falls over. I mean, it's not exactly a kill shot. So as they look out though, what in the name of all those holies digging in the ground over there? Like something just starts going under as the infected start running towards the officer shaky cam style. Dean then gets dragged off screen as the infected are just sort of vibing out, crawling down stuff and jumping through the air. We then meet one woman in a denim dress, the only style of clothing allowed in Australia, staring at some younglings. While that's going on, the geologist is trying to leave the area but finds a storm in her way. Bill has then 
been placed in a holding cell. Seemingly, this thing hasn't been used in a while. As he lays there, though, he appears unconscious. He then gets up as Joe asks him why he did it and what happened. Bill regains his ability to speak and remembers her as the fungus clears from under his skin. Somehow. The only logical conclusion I can come to is by interacting with the neurons. There must be, a again, a compatible neurochemical being utilized, and because of this, it has to be finite, meaning every once in a while, the fungus will lose control due to exhausting the pool of this chemical. Looking at his hands, they are covered in blood. He asks who did this, as then he's informed he took out one of his offspring. He says they wanted him to do it and controlled his meat suit as he begins, like, smacking his head. He says that they are in his head, and his thoughts are being muddled, and he couldn't stop himself. He asks Joe to take him out as he loses control of the meat suit once again, and whatever is controlling him says, it snapped her neck and did it quick. This is the clearest expression that there is a hive mind intelligence at play here, so they lock him in and then go to get some supplies. So what is this species? Not to rehash, but we have to sum this thing up. Clearly it appears to be a form of sapient fungus. Its clear desire is to spread and infect hosts to further its own species, which I mean, what animal doesn't want its own species to thrive? After landing on Earth, by happen chance, our world appears to have the same rules as other species concerning central nervous systems and influence contained within. As a result, it would quickly spread, taking over the entire world if allowed, more so due to the fact that it can spread via spores. Luckily, it landed in Australia, though, where like nine people live, but if it hit a major population center, humanity would have quite a difficult time controlling it. Air scrubbers would be required, as well as biosafety level four suits, due to the fact that it can enter through the skin through touch. So over at the dust storm, that doesn't really seem to move. The geologist then calls in to tell them what she's seeing. Calling back, she tells them, uh, the storm is blocking the road. It's like a wall stopping them from getting out. The geologist says, screw it, I'm gonna drive through it and see what happens. Like a right proper scientist, really. Over at the school, the offspring are in the car, and for some reason, Sam is just like beating the absolute hell out of a dude who's already on the ground. Like, I think you got him, gal. Like, why not go ahead and leave? So here's the thing. There's like so many inconsistent threats. Sometimes these things attack. Sometimes they don't. Mostly they're just docile. But as the younglings look out, Sam gets in the car as they hear screeching. She goes to get the keys as everyone then starts getting stabbed and picked up as this wretched abomination <laughs> crawls away with the infected. Okay then. Don't worry, we're gonna talk about him in a minute because that thing looks hilarious. The geologist, meanwhile, gets turned around and is directed back towards town after having gone on a one-way road. Looking out, she hears screeching again, asking, oh, what was that? Joe and Luke then talk about what they're dealing with as Joe heads out to find the geologist lady. She comes running out, completely freaked out, as then they head back to the station. They lock and load Brides of Christ as they leave behind the stronger force multipliers for some reason. The young adults then try to squad up as they don't want to take anyone out, but hey, sometimes it just be like that. Michelle finally pops up saying she thinks she saw something. This morning, an egg-shaped metallic thing. There are actually two things. Joe is now angry at her saying, Oi, oi, mate, why didn't you report it? Again, that's British. Okay, well, the geologist reported it to you, and you did nothing. So, can you really be mad about that? Heading over to the doctor's house, he's viewing the fungal spores under a microscope, which is, you know, I've made mention several times, confirms we were dealing with what is essentially an alien cordyceps, which infects the central nervous system. One guy is lamenting his offspring as a woman approaches and immediately takes him out. Inconsistent threat remains. Like at this point, just nuke the town from orbit. As Joe enters, she finds them both done so as she hears something moving around. Entering the kitchen, not checking any corners, it's clear someone was just in there. Seeing the outline of a person in the doorway, she stops. So hilariously, walking towards the hallway where we absolutely know this woman is standing based on the fact that she just walked through there, somehow Joe gets jump scared as the infected yells at her. And that's it. She just yells and then runs away. Okay then. I'm just, I'm just not feeling why you should be afraid here. Back over at the Alamo prison, Bill continues standing there like a weirdo as night begins to fall. As they board up the building, the rest of the town just refuses to leave their homes, which is probably actually a pretty good plan, like just lock your door. So there's maybe like 12 people infected. Oh no. Joe then heads outside as she finds one of the young adults is trapped. But not really, because the things do not appear to go after you, again, if you're not important. They then wait for him to pass as then they start trying to make their escape. Luke and Sam watch from afar, trying to convey a sense of danger. Like, they're, they're really kind of like, oh, this is, this is real scary. It's like, literally, Stan Marsh talking about how startled he is uh, when they're making fun of Cloverfield. That's like, you, it's not working. So as they hide against the door, the infected just sort of walk away slowly. Entering the building, it's the young adults and Grandma in a wheelchair. So at this point, White T-shirt throws a rock down the road, getting their attention as they start chasing him. You could have just called out. Why did you have to throw a rock? And you gotta wonder, if they're, like, sprinting with everything they got, do you got enough gas in the tank there, bro? Hopefully, like, 
Hopefully he's done conditioning, unlike Luke. So Wirework then jumps down from the deck, grabbing Michelle, who then just falls and lays there. Because the easiest way to get knocked out is for somebody to slap you in the chest. <laughs> so Joe then jumps on him, his white t-shirt gets the stick taken away from him before Joe fires around into this guy. The other infected sees this, I suppose, as they are all starting their attack and screaming as well. Again, these things have no rules. So a chase now ensues as Joe and Luke take out, like, one. Man, you should have enough of that magazine for this, like, to no longer be a problem as the infected appear to just go down pretty easily. The creature in the background emerges as the infected scream as well and then head towards the Alamo. Bill gets stabbed and pulled up as Joe fires around into the air to get his attention, but they're in the middle of nowhere, so not really that big of a deal. Except for a guy who's, like, I don't know, three miles away who gets struck by a stray bullet. And then jumps down and runs off. Joe enters a green room at this point, no idea why, and she's just, like, shaking her hands. <laughs> it really doesn't seem that stressful. So while all that crap's going on, geologists then find the pile. Back at the station, they talk about what that thing even is, as Joe says they need to get out of there or potentially even talk to the alien itself. The geologist shows up in the van as they go to chase the alien. They roll downtown to get Michelle, who apparently has been knocked out for like a while now because her sternum got smacked. I have no idea. And as she's walking away, her mom grabs her leg. They try to get her to release the leg as the ground starts caving in in the distance. Then the thing emerges. My god, what a masterpiece that is. So it just sort of like struts around at first, so let's take a look at this thing's morphology. First, this is clearly a quadrupedal animal, but has gone through some very strange evolutionary changes for its own benefit, I suppose. Uh, starting with the pointers, its back legs are consistent with digitigrade structuring, and much like how elephants and horses walk on their toes, this creature too appears to walk on very fine points. The muscle striation is visible underneath its dark skin, and as we move the legs, we can see it connects to a pelvic point, much like animals on Earth, actually. It possesses a long tail that it can use in what appears to kind of grab things, at least it's so it's prehensile, and it can be used pretty much offensively as well. Kind of probably a holdover trait from its evolutionary past. On its back, we can see this creature is in fact a vertebrate, as in its torso dips downwards. Of course, here we can see why it's likely more intelligent than the animals on this planet who have a similar physiology. Four-legged animals have proportionally smaller brains than humans because their heads are being held up by muscle. The larger the head, the more muscular connections that are needed, which then they have to be larger and more bolstered. This in turn will cause the skull to move inwards to accommodate, which in turn requires the brain to take up less space. In humanity, our spines actually moved under our skulls, allowing for the muscular connection points to be smaller and the bone to support our skull rather than muscle. Because of this, our brains were allowed to grow as our skulls pushed outwards. In time, this allowed us to become more intelligent according to the theory of evolution where we started looking over grasses and then eating meat we we're probably started as scavengers at first as like you know breaking open bone marrow we would be hunting all these good things basically we didn't eat a bunch of plants to become as intelligent as we are but looking at this creature the chest appears to dip down and then just juts upwards with the arms on either side as well as it's like very clearly seeing that like there's a rib cage there indicating organs also reside in the chest as well what can i say it's just a solid build if you want to protect your organs surround them with bone as the chest goes vertical, this would allow for its own head to be more supported by bone than just muscle. This would allow for it to exhibit an intelligence that is likely beyond man's depending on how old this species is. Homo sapiens is simply in its infancy on a geological scale. The head possesses a massive mouth and a pair of eyes as well, and we can assume that it either breathes our air or somehow is filtering it, but it's not known which. Moving to the hands for a moment, this is a bit strange. While the single point on each leg on the back exists, the hands are exactly just that, hands. There appears to be four appendages on each hand, sort of like operate quite like our hands might. In fact, I always like to say this because it's just fun, uh, your fingers are simply just arms that continue. Your top knuckle is your shoulder, your middle knuckle is your elbow, and your bottom knuckle is your wrist. Our arms just end in many arms. But anyways, back to their hands. It could be for a few reasons that they have these. Given that the tail is prehensile and is used for grabbing, it may be that the hands, while used for walking, allowed them some benefit to manipulate their environment back on their homeworld. Possibly, much like an ape can on our planet, they would then use the hands for walking, but also grasping. Essentially, mostly quadrupedal, but occasionally bipedal if necessary. Maybe even used to just climb up something like a cliffside or potentially native vegetation on their own world. Either way, there is one interesting adaptation that maybe was added through this this species own intervention and this is the ability to create fire. So Joe then fires a shot telling it not to take the girl. As they cut off Michelle's mom's arm, they 
get her to just let go. The alien says thanks and just sort of crawls off with the infected. As the young adults have all survived, we now move back over to that pile. The alien then places everyone in there who had become infected as in it starts burning them. The alien is here for cleanup duty only, it appears, so I guess maybe he's just chill like that. This fire creation seems to suggest something about these things though. I don't know if this is an adaptation or this is just technology. It was clearly chasing the meteorite that crashed into Earth and then quarantined the area with a storm that violates our understanding of how to create storms by turning people around. I guess that really wouldn't violate the laws of physics, but obviously a physicist is going to yell at me in the comments for this. Obviously it would require you to basically fold space time. That's kind of what's hypothesized to be on the edge of our universe. Like you're just going forward and then it just kind of folds you back into the universe. Then you start going towards the universe again. And that's pretty much how it just kind of does it with that storm. It's just like a bound or like the out of bounds area of a video game. But because of this, I believe the fire breathing may mean that this is applied to the creature after. I don't think this is a biomechanical suit or anything, but things that were adapted for a specific job, like a human holding a flame inverter. But with this creature, it is simply applied to the mouth instead, since it's quadrupedal. The next morning, as the cops emerge, they gotta be thinking about all that back pay for work in the last 36 hours. Joe and Sam talk about absolutely nothing, as Luke tells Joe that he's decided to take a job in the city. I don't ever remember him mentioning this at all. I remember, you know, Joe talking to her sister Sam about this, but not Luke. So as Joe looks at the drawings her nephew made, it's an alien. And to conclude, I have to ask, has anyone checked on the Australians to see if they are okay? This was an absolutely bizarre movie. Now, one thing I did want to discuss before wrapping all of this up is how dumbfounded I am by the cleanup job. First and foremost, as we saw, insects are infected with the fungus. Burrowing marsupials are infected by the fungus. Humans are infected by the fungus. While the humans were rounded up and destroyed, how can you know if you got every bug? How can you know there's not an animal in a burrow somewhere just chilling out? The reality is the only option to actually stop this from spreading is like the flood on Africa, and Halo is to glass half the continent. You would need to scorch earth it because one alien rounded up a few people who were infected, that in no way fixes the issue when you have something like a bug going out and infecting everyone, or maybe even a bird flying around who's infected. Either way, this cleanup job goes beyond humanity, and it could be an entire ecosystem killer. But anyhow, I want to hear what you guys think. How boned is humanity? Spoiler, super boned. I'll drop my Twitter, Discord, Patreon, and Roanoke Tales channel link where last week we talked about the lizard man of or swamp. But speaking of patrons, I'd like to thank mine real quick. First, huge thank you to our astrophysicist, Des Dancer, as well as our scientist, Chad the Enjoyer of Scientific Explanations of B Grade Horror Movies, Dakota 23, Jax, Lucian Dragon, Metric System, and Trash Panda in a Trench Coat. And the rest of my patrons, I appreciate y'all support as well. It's very, like, thank you. You guys are ballers. Uh, your help goes a long way towards keeping everything running. Like I said, I greatly appreciate it. But alright, that's gonna do it for me. I hope everyone enjoyed, and I'll see y'all in the next one.